Chapter 13. Miracle. It is early afternoon. Charlie has eaten her lunch at the table on the gravel terrace down by the lake, where it is shady. While she ate, Sadie lay at her feet, hoping for a piece of sandwich. Coyote stayed under the camellia bush next to the terrace, as close as Sadie as he could get without getting too close to Charlie. She has saved some crust from her sandwich, and now that she is finished, gives one to Sadie and throws the other to Coyote. He jumps up and backs away, as if it is a stone she's thrown. But when Sadie starts over to get his crust, he snatches it before she can get near. Charlie hears Bethann Davis calling for Sadie from across the lake. Sadie's ears prick up, but she keeps her eyes on Charlie in case there are any more treats. Sorry, girl, Charlie says. That's all there is. Guess you'll just have to go home. Bethann calls again, and then Mrs. Davis whistles, and Sadie heads down to the water. She stands for a moment before starting across, her big gold plume of a tail waving gently as she tries to decide whether to stay or go. When Bethann calls once more, she jumps forward into the water and starts swimming. Coyote follows her to the lake, as always, and stands with his front feet in the water, watching Sadie swim. When she's about halfway across, he whines, but doesn't start after her. She gets all the way across, climbs out of the water, shakes herself, and runs up the hill. Still, Coyote doesn't move. He will go any minute, Charlie thinks. Of course he will. Much as he hates swimming, he always follows Sadie eventually. But he doesn't. He stands a while longer, looking toward where she's disappeared, and then turns around, goes back to the camellia bush, and lies down. Sadie's gone home, and Coyote has stayed. He's made a choice. Between Charlie and Sadie, he's chosen Charlie. At first, she doesn't move. She's afraid if she does anything, makes even the slightest sound, he'll realize what he's done and take off. Liver. She needs to get him some liver, reward him for staying. Slowly, carefully, looking away from him every minute, she eases herself out of the chair and starts up to the house. Good dog, she says as she goes. Her voice is low and soothing as she can make it. Just stay there. Good old boy. Sarita, she yells when she gets inside. You'll never... But Sarita must have been watching from the windows by her puzzle table. She's already coming from the kitchen with the sandwich bag full of liver pieces. Coyote's still under the camellia. Charlie wants to run down the drive and throw herself at him, hug him, and rub his ears as if he's a regular dog. Her regular dog. It is all she can do to walk slowly down to the terrace, keeping her eyes focused on the table and chairs, and sit down. Good dog, she says again, amazed and relieved that he's still there. Want some liver? She's been talking to him about the liver she takes him every evening, saying the word over and over as he comes to get the pieces she puts out so that he'll know what the word means, something he really, really likes. And he's been coming gradually closer and closer to get it. But still, he hasn't taken the pieces closest to her. She always sees him as she and Sarita drive away, sneaking back to get the last of them. She turns to look at him now, and their eyes meet. He doesn't bolt. She feels the tremor of their connection. Liver, she says. Every time you stay here when Sadie goes home, you get to have liver. She takes the biggest piece she can find, holds it between her thumbs and first finger so that it sticks out away from her hand, turns her head away, and holds the liver out to him as far as her arm will reach. Is he coming to get it? She can't tell. She doesn't dare turn to see. She holds her breath, makes herself as still as she can. Come on, she thinks at him. You can do it. Come get the liver. Suddenly, the liver is gone from her fingers. He has taken it so gently she didn't even feel his muzzle near her hand. Just one moment, the liver between her fingers, the next moment, gone. Moving in slow motion, she pulls her hand back and gets another piece of liver. She extends her arm again, and again, the liver disappears. Three more times, she does it. Then she holds the last piece out in her cupped palm so that he'll have to touch her to get it. It takes longer this time, but he gets it, his nose and whiskers grazing her hand. At his touch, her eyes blur with tears. Good dog, she whispers. Good, brave dog. The sandwich bag is empty now, so she turns to look at him. He is no more than two feet away. He stands his ground, his ears and tail looking at her as if to ask if there's any more. All gone, she says, and shows him an empty bat, her empty hands. He stands for another moment, then turns and goes back to the camellia. He doesn't run. He doesn't skulk. He just walks back and lies down. Charlie looks up at the window of the lake from above her. Sarita's there, watching. She smiles and nods, and Charlie holds up both thumbs. Wild forever, Mr. Hayward said. Not this dog. Coyote stays in the yard the rest of the day. When Charlie's father comes home, he scuttles across the road into the woods for a little, but comes back to his place under the dogwood when Paul Morgan goes inside. 
Charlie calls Mrs. Davis and tells her that Coyote stayed when Sadie went home. That's fabulous, Charlie, she says. The kids said they hadn't seen him, and I was a little worried. I thought something might have happened to him. He's fine. Looks like your hard work is paying off. Anyway, if he stays over here and you won't have to keep Sadie inside tonight, Mrs. Davis laughs, and you won't have to risk hearing Buddy Hayward tell you how impossible and dangerous this whole project is. After dinner, Charlie's father goes back to the office. At the time, she would normally have gone around to Coyote's territory with the liver. Charlie splashes on insect repellent again and goes out to sit on the brick retaining wall. Coyote under the dogwood stays where he is, his eyes on her. Brought you liver, she says. His ears flick toward her. She holds a piece out towards him, but he doesn't move. Suit yourself, she says. Half an hour later, she goes inside, leaving three pieces of liver on the wall where she was sitting. Before she gets to the top of the ramp, he has snatched and gulped them down. Then he goes back to settle into his place again. The lights on the ramp are on a timer set to go on before it gets completely dark. A little while after they come on, Charlie goes out to check on Coyote. He isn't by the fence where he was before. She checks under the camellia, behind the boxwoods, even goes out to look among the azaleas. He's not there. When she goes back inside, Sarita looks up from her jigsaw puzzle, a painting of the Cape Hatter's lighthouse. The television's on. Other people watch television, Charlie thinks. Sarita only listens while she does her puzzles. He's gone, Charlie says. She had hoped he'd stay the night. Sarita nods. A good day, though, she says, and fits a piece into the stream of light cutting across a bank of storm clouds. The moment she says it, Charlie knows that it's more than good. It's the best day she's had all summer. Chapter 14. Watchdog when Charlie goes out the next morning, dressed to walk around the lake as always, Coyote appears from the trees across the road and stands at the head of the driveway, looking at her. She can hardly believe her eyes. Good morning, Coyote, she calls, and spreads out both of her arms like a mother inviting a child to come running for a hug. He doesn't come, but he doesn't back off either. His tail, a pale golden plume, stands straight up over his back, and she thinks she sees it move. The beginnings of a wag! Want your lunch, she asks, thinking it is time to change the word to breakfast if he is going to eat it first thing in the morning like this. But he does know the word. As soon as she says it, he takes a few hesitant steps down the drive. Then he sits, watching her expectantly. Okay, I'll be right out with it. When she takes his bowl outside, he scuttles off into the trees. She puts it down where she has been feeding him lately, on the driveway nearest place by the dogwood. Then she goes to sit on the retaining wall. Come and get it, she calls. He emerges from the woods onto the road. His tail is down now, and his ears are back, his shoulders hunched forward. He's a wild thing again. What's the matter, Charlie asks? You took liver from my hand last night. At the word liver, his ears twitch, but he doesn't relax. He's been eating with her, sitting and watching for days. What's the problem? And then she knows. The problem is that Sadie isn't here. It's just him and Charlie. It's okay, she tells him. Really it is. You took liver from my hand yesterday, remember? Sadie wasn't with you then. But that was yesterday. There was a night to get through since then. Wherever he was, like all his other nights, he was alone. Alone meant having to be on guard, watch out, survive, even while he slept. Besides, sleeping can wipe out memories so that you have to start over again in the morning. Charlie knows how it is to wake up in your old self all over again and have to get used to what has changed in your life. Okay, guys, she says. She goes back into the house. Almost the instant the door slides shut, Coyote comes down the drive and eats. He still leans forward and snatches no more than a bite or two between glances over his shoulder. But he eats, and when he's finished, he flops down in his place under the dogwood. Later, when Charlie's reading on the terrace, a fishing boat comes by, its electric trawling motor making a barely perceptible hum. Coyote goes down to the bushes at the edge of the lake and barks at it. That's some new watchdog you've got there, Mr. Sutcliffe shouts over the barking. Coyote barks until the boat has gone on down the lake, and even the ripples have faded. Then he comes back to lie down under the camellia. Charlie imagines him congratulating himself for having chased off a dangerous enemy. This barking is another step forward, she thinks. Their yard has become Coyote's territory. That day, a new pattern begins. The daily hikes are over. After dinner, Charlie takes Coyote his liver pieces, and little by little, he begins to come up to her and take them from her hand, even when she's looking at him. At dusk, he disappears, but when she goes outside in the morning, he is there, lying up by the road or sitting at the end of the driveway, waiting for her. If her father leaves before Charlie goes out, he never sees the dog, but Charlie is sure Coyote isn't going back around the lake anymore. 
He has found a place in the woods across the road to spend the night. Sadie comes over later, sometimes swimming, sometimes on the road. Charlie always has a book with her, but she doesn't get much reading done. After a while, she figures out what the dogs are telling each other with their ears and their tails and the expressions on their faces. If she kept a notebook like Jane Goodall did with the chimpanzee, she thinks, it would have more interesting information about, about dogs than the training books do. The only change in the new pattern happens on the 4th of July. Fireworks aren't legal in North Carolina, but they are in South Carolina, and Eagle Lake is only a few miles from the South Carolina border, so there are plenty of firecrackers and bottle rockets around the lake on the 4th. The minute the firecrackers start going off in the early afternoon, Coyote disappears. Charlie and her father, Sarita, have been in invited to the Sutcliffe's for a picnic supper, along with most of the rest of the people from the north side of the lake. Coyote hasn't shown up again when it's time for them to leave, so he doesn't get his evening liver. She leaves a few pieces on the retaining wall. When they get home after the picnic, there's no sign of Coyote. The liver is still on the wall. Deep booms fill the night with the official fireworks in downtown Charlotte. Charlie worries all night about where Coyote is and whether he'll come back. He's, she's heard a dog so frightened by fireworks that they run off and get lost and are never seen again. But when she goes out the next morning... The liver is gone, and he is there, lying out by the road. Just taking care of myself, he seems to say. You can't be too careful.